Welcome to another episode of Getting to Know the Expert. What a treat that we have today. Oh my goodness, Dr. Valentino is wonderful. You are in for a very special treat. Not only does he talk very eloquently, I think, about gene therapy and uh, what it was like being a part of some of those treatments um, and the development of those treatments in uh, the biotech industry, he also talks about his desire to make a switch from his academic physician work towards working in a biotech company. Fantastic stuff. He also gives great advice and thoughts on COVID-19, vaccine development, what we can expect in the upcoming months. And then we finish off the conversation talking about The Last Dance. He is a Chicago native. If you're not into The Last Dance, which is the documentary series on ESPN about Michael Jordan and I guess it's the 98 Bulls, Oh my gosh, I just started watching it and it's great. We all need content here in this time. And let me tell you, if you're not a sports fan, it's fine. You can still watch it because it's not about sports. It's about dreams. You're going to be into it. It's going to be great. It's a great cast of characters. Excited for you guys to get to know Dr. Valentino. He feels very inviting and accessible to me in a really lovely way. He is a leader of our national organization. He's a physician. Uh, Most of our listeners are patients and caretakers, and um, I think we have all experienced feeling a little bit on the outside of um, the physician space at times and how difficult that can be when you you have so many questions that you need specifically answered. And he really speaks about about the mission of his work and the vision of his work being patient-centered. And he wants to really harness the patient voice. And that means listening to all of you. And I take that to heart. I think that is something that's very special. And I think he has put his money where his mouth is in terms of this webinar series that the organization has created here on Fridays during the COVID crisis. If you haven't participated, I encourage you to do so. They gather community questions and um, the webinars that are every Friday are generated from community questions. So if you have some reservations about things, um, if you have some concerns, not just about COVID per se, but a lot of things here in the community, mental health, joint disease, they really want to start listening to you guys in a way that you'll get some answers quickly. So I would love for you guys to engage with that. That'd be great. And hopefully this, this podcast conversation will give you a little window into who he is and uh, you will feel more and more comfortable with your national leader, which I think is really exciting. So here's our Thursday episode, our get to know you episode, and I hope you will enjoy it. So stick around for a great conversation with Dr. Valentino. Hey, listeners of Ask the Expert, I have something that you might enjoy. The Pain Podcast, a new bloodstream media podcast made possible by Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Pain affects us all, and for those of us living with chronic conditions, pain can have an even more prominent role. That's why I am so proud to share with you the Pain Podcast, dedicated to exploring pain from every angle. The Pain Podcast provides expert knowledge, innovative strategies, and firsthand stories from people on the front lines of the pain epidemic. Psychodynamic therapy, opioids, cannabis, chiropractic, surgery, Systematic racism, Western medicine, the healthcare system, and gender bias are just some of the topics explored in the first season of this documentary-style audio experience. The Pain Podcast is produced by Bloodstream Media and sponsored by Tremo Pharmaceuticals. Tremo is currently investigating two COX-2 selective NSAIDs, NSAID, for those of you who aren't familiar, stands for non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs. While neither of these treatments are FDA approved, they are in clinical trials, and you can learn more about those trials, Tremo's mission, and the dedicated team leading it by going to TremoRx.com. That's T-R-E-M-E-A-U-R-X.com. And don't forget to subscribe to the Pain Podcast from BloodstreamMedia.com. Dr. Valentino, thank you so much for sticking around for our Getting to Know the Expert episode. This segment is for our listeners to get to know you a little better, and I promise you it will be painless. I promise. Okay, I'm ready. (laughs) So the first question is a very random question, but I specifically want to know, NHF is based in New York, right in the middle of Manhattan. Were you already based in New York, or did you move? Do you work remote? 
So I am born and raised in the Chicago area. As I said, I spent time in Omaha, Nebraska for medical school and undergraduate in Los Angeles. True to heart, I am a Chicagoan. So I live in Chicago and I work remotely, but I travel pretty extensively and I've done that for the last 20 years. So, uh, you know, having a, a remote office for me is in many ways United Airlines. I see that, you know, the need is to be in the community and around the community. So although I live in Chicago, I think the, the real goal is, is getting into the community and being part of the community as much as possible. One of the coolest things about NHF in recent years, I think they have hired the right person for the job regardless of location, and they really lean into that remote work. So that is great. That's wonderful. I was wondering if you had to make a move to New York, and I was going to ask you about your New York routine, but there's no need. So you mentioned in the first episode um, your interest in genetics in the beginning of your career. What was it that was so fascinating about genetics, and in particular, bleeding disorder genetics that got your wheels turning? Actually, it wasn't genetics of bleeding disorders initially. Um, so Dr. Henry Lynch was a pioneer in cancer genetics, and he mm. described uh, familial polyposis syndrome, which is an inherited colon cancer syndrome. So when I was an undergraduate student, I was actually doing research uh, with him to understand the genetics of rare cancers. He really instilled in me the desire for intellectual curiosity, and that has followed me throughout my entire career. When I um, was uh, an intern and resident, I worked pretty extensively. We had a large hemophilia population in, in my uh, training program. And it was a great opportunity to begin to learn about that. And that's really at a time when hemophilia genetics was just emerging uh, as an area for investigation. People were not being genotyped. We were just um, understanding the factor eight gene uh, so I became very interested at that point in hemophilia genetics and the, the mechanisms of disease that resulted in, in this bleeding disorder. What were those first years of practicing medicine like? Um, what lessons did you learn that are still with you today? Probably the most important lesson that I learned is always listen to the patient. You, you can have your own opinion, but you know until you walk in another man's shoes, you really don't know what it's like. I was really fortunate because, as I said, there were quite a few hemophilia patients in, in our uh, training program that I was able to, to take care of. And it's ironic because I cared for a few brothers. Uh, there, were, there were two families that I can remember very distinctly uh, when I was an intern and a resident. And then I went off and I did my fellowship and I, I came back to Chicago and I ended up caring for these same patients uh, when I became a faculty member. And, you know, I remember to the day, you know, that, that just listening to them and listening to their stories was so important. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount from my patients. And, you know, one of the things that I really enjoyed about our hemophilia clinic was we had sort of the cradle to grave type of clinic. So we had all ages. We didn't segregate our patients by pediatric or adult patients. We saw everybody. And having the opportunity to listen to some of the older gentlemen about what their life was like in the you know, 1940s, uh, growing up with hemophilia, taught me how to take care of patients you know, in the 1990s and 2000s. You've worked for biotech companies um, as a medical director. What was that like, being so close to the development of these innovative treatments? What, what was that like? My decision to go from academic practice to uh, industry and to biotech was really predicated on a desire to reach a, a, a broader population. And what I mean by that is that um, in probably about 2006, 2007, I attended a WFH meeting and learned about the WFH twinning program. And at that time, I developed a, an application and Rush applied to be a WFH twin. And we um, had the opportunity to twin with a program in Abuja, Nigeria, the National Hospital in Abuja, Nigeria. And I visited and spent time in Abuja and I saw the serious need for care um, around the world. And at that time, I decided that I really needed to do something different to, to try to do more global medicine. 
and I realized that the place to do global medicine was in a global organization. And that's when I made a decision, you know, over the course of five years uh, to, to move to industry. And then at the end of 2013, I retired from my clinical practice in academic medicine and went to a biotech company. And it was there that I was able to really have that type of global position and have global influence over how treatment was delivered across the globe. I love that. I'm not going to lie. I was not expecting you to say that answer. And I love that answer. That was super rewarding. I mean, that was that opportunity taught me a tremendous amount. You know, I was in one company with three different names over the course of four and a half years. It was just a great opportunity to, to really see um, how care was delivered um, mm. in Latin America, in Asia, in Europe, in uh, Central America, as well as in the United States. So it, it was a tremendous opportunity to see the delivery models that were there, you know, how people related to their practitioners. So it, it was a great opportunity. And, and those are the lessons that I've learned that I bring with me now to NHF. What barriers did you see in terms of the treatment disparity across the globe? What do we need to get better at uh, to make sure that everyone has access to these treatments? Well, the first thing is diagnosis. There's so many patients that are people with bleeding disorders around the world who don't have a diagnosis. You know, so the, the mission of WFH is so important to ensure that everybody is accurately identified and diagnosed with their, their bleeding disorder. And then, you know, once they're diagnosed, there has to be treatment available. So, you know, I witnessed and we did a, a quite a bit of work in China, for example, and patients in China have bleeds but they never come to the clinic. Why don't they come to the clinic? Because there's no access to treatment. So, you know, that's changed now. It's, it's much better, you know, in the last decade. But, you know, when I first started uh, doing some of this work, patients didn't see the need to go to a clinic because there was mm -hmm. nothing that could be done for them. So I think there, there's a tremendous amount that we still have to do, and we're by no means done innovating for patients around the globe. What are your personal reservations about gene therapy? I mean, I spent uh, the last two and a half years uh, focusing pretty, uh, you know, exclusively on gene therapy development um, and trying to understand uh, how to best deliver uh, gene therapy to the community. Gene therapy has tremendous promise. There's no doubt that, that at, at some point this will become our go-to treatment for, you know, a large proportion of hemophilia patients. But again, it's not a decision that I can make for a patient. I can only offer the treatment, you know, as a practitioner and all of our clinicians can offer treatments. But it's really a shared decision that has to be made between the clinician and the patient and his family. And, and you know, hopefully we're going to get to the point where we can talk about, uh, you know, her family for von Willebrand disease and, and women who are affected with bleeding disorders as well. But, you know, it, it's really that interplay between the, the clinician and the patient and family to make that decision. And I'm not sure that we have all the information at this point to be able to firmly make that decision. We're hoping that we're going to be able to get more information as the investigational products continue to mature and the data matures. And, you know, I'm really excited. I'm very hopeful that we're going to be at a point where, as I said, gene therapy will be our go-to treatment. Shifting a little bit to your personal thoughts about the COVID crisis, how do you think we're doing as um, a country and what can the community do um, at large to slow down the outbreak? What are your thoughts? Well, I'm a firm believer in uh, uh, shelter in place. I, mm. I really think that we need to do our best to limit exposure. This is, this is a, clearly a deadly virus that's highly infectious. So, you know, the social distancing, which I really don't like that word. I think we should be using the phrase physical distancing. Social mm -hmm. distancing sort of has the connotation of uh, social separation. I think we need to be socially engaged ever more, uh, but physically distant. So physical distancing, I think is gonna be really important. It's clear that, you know, wearing a mask and all the things that the CDC is talking about are critically important. I'm hopeful that we will have a vaccine in the not too distant future. 
I'm fearful that without a vaccine, we're not going to have our lifestyle back, you know, until that point. There was a report today that Pfizer is going into trial for, I think, four different COVID vaccines at the same time they're trying to speed up the process. Can you describe a little bit of that clinical trial process from, you know, the pharmaceutical company point of view? And, and what should we as the public be paying attention to? There's more than 100 vaccines that are candidates that are currently under investigation. This is, uh, you know, multiple shots on goal, and hopefully one of them will score. But I think, you know, we have to be realistic that there has been um, now almost two and a half decades of research to find a vaccine for HIV, and we still don't have that vaccine. Uh, you know, we're looking for a vaccine for other coronaviruses. We're looking for a vaccine for Ebola virus, and, and none of those have come to the forefront. So, you know, I hope we're lucky uh, with COVID, uh, with coronavirus and, and this SARS virus that we will get a vaccine. But I think the population has to be realistic that that, that may not actually happen. We may not have a vaccine uh, that's going to protect us, and we're going to have to develop you know, sort of nature's way of immunity, like we have for other viruses that will continue to recur each year. So the, the process is going to be long and, and hopefully not too painful and not too, you know, many more deaths. But I think we have to be realistic to understand that this may not actually happen. Uh, hopefully we'll get treatments. But the investigational process really has to focus on first the safety. Um, these, whether it's a, a drug for treatment or it's a vaccine to prevent, we have to ensure that it's safe. And that can only be done through um, rigorous investigation following research protocol that allows us to look for safety signals. We don't want to put our patients at any undue risk. So it's really ensuring the safety first. And then if the agent is safe, then we can start to look at the efficacy of those products. But, you know, the Food and Drug Administration has laid out a very clear path for drug development. And, you know, you can try to shortcut the path as much as you want, but we have to, you know, for public safety, ensure that our drugs are safe. What will happen if cities and counties open too quickly? Oh, you're asking me to have a crystal ball. <laughs> Well, you have like a doctor before your name. And so we all just think that you must have the right answers. <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to be different for different parts of the country. You know, if you're in, uh, in Wyoming, Montana, um, where, you know, social distancing or physical distancing is already commonplace, you know, I, I think the, the likelihood of, of, you know, lessening restrictions is, is a much lower risk. Because, you know, inherently those populations are already physically distant. If you're in New York City where the population density is so high, you know, I think that's, that's the reflection that we're seeing, for example, in nursing homes where the population density is high. It's a high risk population, but there's a, you know, dense population of people that are in a constricted and uh, or restricted environment. So it's going to be different for every part of the country to assess their risks and, and when it's appropriate for them to reopen. But I, I do think that following the work from home policies, physical distancing, you know, the, all of the things that the CDC has been promoting, you know, good hygiene, um, wearing a mask, et cetera, I think is going to be important for the foreseeable future. Do you miss patient care? You know, everybody asks me that question. So here's how I answer it. Amy, I miss you but I don't miss taking care of you. That makes total sense. I miss the social interactions. I mean, I yeah. love my patients. Um, I still hear from a lot of them. I wish I'd hear from even more because I love those, those social interactions. It was, that was really um, so good. And, and when I told you before that our clinics were um, cradle to grave, that was really one of the beauties of it because you know I was taking care of uh, a newborn baby, his mother, as well as the, his grandfather. And that was really cool. And then we had um, people with von Willebrand disease. And, you know, it might have been the mother and the father and, you know, a kid or two. Um, and then all of a sudden, we were taking care of the aunt. And then we had the grandmother, you know, because it, it, was, it was an opportunity to really create these social networks for people. And there was, there was a real bond between the practitioners in, in, you know, in the program, as well as with the patients and their families. So yeah, I do miss the social part of it. But, uh, 
you know, you, you get your, uh, your adrenaline from other places. Last question, arguably the most important question. You are from Chicago. Are you watching The Last Dance? Are you a Chicago Bulls fan? I am a big Chicago Bulls fan, and I am a big Michael Jordan fan. I am watching. I, I, I'm really impressed with some of the behind-the-scenes uh, things. The last episode that I was, the part that I was really impressed with, I don't think any of us have, have really recognized the pressure that people that are in this spotlight are under. And I mm-hmm. think that's true of whether they're, you know, in the entertainment industry or they're professional athletes or politicians, you know, whatever puts people into the spotlight, I think there's a, a, a tremendous amount of, of pressure and expectation for them, you know, in the public eye. And I, I think we all have to have some degree of respect for that because it's it's got to be incredibly difficult uh, to be able to deal with that on a on a daily basis. I think so too. I am a huge sports fan and I just started watching it. And I remember I was a teenager during those years. And I remember just idolizing Scottie Pippen. And it, I always loved like the supporting, the supporting character and those types of things. But to watch their dynamic, to watch the, I don't, the passion and the ferocious need to win, I think is so inspiring to me as somebody who shies away from that. I think it's also really powerful to see uh, you know, you mentioned Scottie Pippen. You see where he came from. You see why he made some of the decisions that he made early in his career, really focusing on his family. And it really goes back to, you know, what's important to you? And, you know, throughout the, the discussion that we've had, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, harking back to, you know, what's important. And what's important is ensuring that, that you and your family are, are taken care of. That's our basic need. And I think, uh, you know, that, that last dance is a good example of that, that, that we all need to be thinking about what our basic needs are and how we can best achieve those, uh, whether it's personally or professionally. Thank you, Dr. Valentino, for that fantastic conversation and uh, for ending things, um, of course, with the last dance. What a terrific conversation. What an engaging conversation. We really appreciate it. Listeners, that is all for episode 39 of the Ask the Expert podcast series. We're going to be back next month with another expert interview. We'll see you then.